Hey, good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Are, 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 are we ready? Are we ready? <laughs> front row love, front row love. Hey, uh, welcome, everybody. I know that we have a very full parking lot, so thank you for your flexibility. People are still making their way in. We have an incredible morning planned for you. If you're new or a little newer to Avalon, my name is Pastor K. Paul, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at this great church. And I want to start with just telling any of you that might be here as a guest, first and foremost, when you get connected, we truly get better as a church. We believe with all of our hearts that every person counts. In fact, we're the kind of church that is counting on every person counting. Look at the person next to you and say, you count. Say it. <laughs> you count. You matter. You matter to me. You matter to God. We love you. And when you fill out that Connect card, well, you guys are really into this. <laughs> I love it. There's a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. Fill that card out. That card is our way of saying you matter in a big way. When you get it filled out, you can turn that in when the offering plate goes by in a little bit. Or you can take it to the first time guest area. Why don't you raise your hand, my brother. Raise your hand, Tyler. You can get a gift over there at the first time guest area. Uh, area. And in that gift is something amazing. It's amazing. I'm going to show you what it is. Are you ready? It's incredible. It's something that makes sure that you get coffee into your life as soon as possible. Give it a hand for the Avalon coffee mug. There it is. Inside there is an Avalon bumper sticker. Yes, we're proud of our church. A pen and yes, chocolate for the ride home. You're going to want some of that. Please get a gift at the end of the service. Now, there's a couple things I want to draw your attention to. If you have a bulletin, you can grab it. I'm going to make this quick, and then we're going to get started. First, we have table talks in two weeks. This is our family worship weekend. We have kind of put new life and energy into this weekend. We are going to have round tables in this space where we're going to invite every generation to the table. Every voice matters. We're going to have students and grandparents and everything in between talking about the mission of God and the heart of God and why the church is represented by every generation. Amen. We want to be the kind of church that says to every generation, you matter and we live on mission here at Avalon. Secondly, I want to tell you about 24-7 prayer. 24-7 prayer is 24 hours a day, seven days, starting October 6th. We are going to, as a church, courageously pray that we can take next steps in our faith. And this starts October 6th. You can sign up on our website, avalonmc.com. Check it out. Be a part of it. We pray every hour for an entire 168-hour week here in this building. We are the kind of church that prays. Be ready for that. Finally, we have a worship night with First Missionary Church. They're a church that's a part of our denomination. Some of you are wondering, why, why are we worshiping together? Because we as a church are passionate about saying the church is better together. The local congregations that claim Christ and his work on the cross are better together. Be ready for October 11th, a night of worship. All right, here we go. I thought before we had the choir come out, I would do a little dance for you guys. So I'm going to set this over here. Are you guys ready? Totally kidding. I'm not going to dance. It, it would be super disappointed. Maybe next weekend if you come back, I'll dance for you. Hey, guys, they've traveled all the way from South Africa. They are an amazing group of students that are changing a continent for hope. They are the future of what God is doing in South Africa. Will you give them a very warm, big welcome to the Kuyasa Kids Choir?
Now, do you all see why I didn't dance before they got up here, right? Hey, uh, let's give them one more round of applause, can't we? Thank you, guys. Amazing. I have the privilege of introducing you to a very special man and his wife. He's going to represent both of them this morning. But I want to uh, just have you help me give a very warm welcome to Andres and his wife, Nellie Vandermerway, who are very much leading on the ground in South Africa. They are very much fighting for justice. They are the ones that are playing point on helping over close to maybe even over 900 children that have in many ways lost their parents or have fought great battles and they're giving them great hope. Would you welcome to the platform Andres Vandermerwe. Now, I was going to try to say his last name correctly, but you're going to find out how, how, how bad I said it because I'd, I'd ask, can you share with us how to pronounce your last name yeah, properly? Yeah, it's actually very easy. Oh, very easy. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's Van der Merwe, <laughs> uh, and it's a Dutch surname, but I, I think the American tongue cannot do that. Okay, we're going to... Maybe in heaven. Okay, it may be in heaven. Okay, yeah. In heaven. yeah, thank you. Brother, you are... First of all, you're a friend. My wife and I visited you all in 2011. And from that point forward, we've just been so touched and moved by the work that you and your family and so many have been, uh, that you're connected to and leading. The work that you've been doing has brought great hope. And I wonder if you could just share with us all how you started in this great journey of bringing hope to orphans. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, um, uh, we started as missionaries in about 21 years ago first working amongst unreached people group, planting churches, stayed there for five years, um, came back to South Africa, um, training up pastors about HIV and AIDS and how to use the Bible as reference to teach and to preach about this disease. And um, while we were teaching in the rural areas, we found the orphan children and living in the most appalling conditions. And God broke our hearts. We tried to uh, ourselves supply what we could to the kids but that we met. But we realized that this problem was beyond our reach. And we started praying, Lord, raise up someone, raise up our own organization. We, we can't do it on our own. We prayed for two months. And then Horizon International, Bob Pearson, found us. And that is how we started in, in 2003. 2003, That's amazing. Great. And how many, how many children are impacted right now in the area where you're leading? How many children are impacted by the work of Horizon? <clears throat> well, we've got four daycare centers, or we call it drop-in centers, that we prepare about 6,000 meals every month for the kids. Um, but we are working in 25 villages. Wow. But there are 131 in our target area. So the scope is thousands. So 131 villages we're working in... 30. 25. 25. Yes. Okay, that's incredible. Uh, how does child sponsorship, we've, we've all, many of us have, have heard about child sponsorship. We see organizations that are great, doing great things. Uh, Horizon's unique. We, 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 we do things, Horizon does things in ways that are just built on relationships in every, every way. Wonder if you could share with us the difference in the lives of orphan children and youth through Horizon. What difference is it making? Well, $40, $40 a month um, is a need for the kids, but it's an opportunity for us to sponsor a kid. But the difference in the life of the child, uh, remember when a child gets orphaned, many times it's an aunt's orphan. So the child is an outcast in his own community, in his own school, and stripped of his dignity. When sponsorship comes, that child is restored. Um, and it becomes like um, almost everybody wants to be sponsored. Yeah. Um, so they, they, they come to the daycare center. They find other kids there uh, in the same situation as themselves. They get love. They get our staff becomes the sort of parents there. Um, uh, we help them with uh, schoolwork. 
we help them with uh, sport activities, and there, many of them meet Jesus and give their lives to Jesus. It's incredible. La- last hour, you described that before sponsorship, many of these children are known as outcasts. Absolutely. They have an outcast label on them. Yes. And when they're sponsored, they go from the back of the line, pushed out in many ways as an outcast, to the front of the line. Absolutely. Uh, because of the honor and the joy they have in having yes. a, an American sponsor. Yes. It's just incredible. Tell us, what does these resources do in the life of a child? What does $40 a month do for these children? Yes. Well, the, the most of the money goes to a food parcel that is delivered to the child's household. Um, then also, if the child needs like school funds, school clothing, bags, um, go on a tour with the school, medical, like glasses, that type of thing that uh, is not covered by government, uh, Ryzen steps in, we take them to the doctor or the specialist, and the, the, uh, the child gets cared for. Yeah, so they have, I mean, they, they get health care, they get yes. education, many times uh, they get clothing. Absolutely. Uh, they, they get a, just an incredible amount of help through, yes. through these resources. What would you tell us? I mean, we're, we're sitting here, we're, many of us are new to what's happening on the ground in South Africa. What would you tell us today about the state of, of these children, those especially that are not sponsored yet? Uh, help us understand a little more of the journey they, they are on, um, maybe in waiting to get sponsored. Yeah. What's it like for that, for that child? Well, uh, at the moment, we've got about 200 kids waiting for sponsorship. Um, we, we could have brought many, many hundreds more, but we don't want to create an expectation that we cannot fulfill. Mm-hmm. Because uh, the child's already been rejected many times in life. So if you come back from America, say, but sorry, we didn't get a sponsor for yeah. you. It, it's not good for the child. So I've got about 200 waiting. But um, yes, they, they're actually praying, waiting. Many people are in South Africa hoping for sponsorship. Yeah. Andres, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And, and Nelly, thank you for the incredible work, for your passion, for your fighting on the front lines of injustice, thank that you. you might represent the just heart of God. Can we all give Andres and Nelly just a big thank you? And a, 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 Round of applause. Thank you very much. In just a moment, we're going to have our time of of giving back. This is a part of our worship. This is where we get to say to God, thank you for all that you have given us. And I love this part of our service because it's an extension. It's It's a thank you. God has given us so much. And uh, there's a couple areas, actually, I want to just draw your attention to, because sometimes we don't always know what our money goes, goes towards, our gifts go to. I'm going to explain those. As I do, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. They're going to uh, pass the plates. And there's two areas that I want to draw your attention to, as I'd mentioned. The first is this. We, as a church, are now partnering with Horizon International, meaning that and someone was clapping. You can clap for that. That's a great thing. That means, yes, that means that we are saying we are not only going to hopefully sponsor children, but as a church, we're going to join a world-changing organization to step onto the front line of fighting injustice and bringing light into darkness. In every mission organization we partner with, we want to be a part of fighting for the things that are at the heart of God. So we as a church are giving towards this incredible organization. Your gifts are helping bring hope and power and courage to 2,500 already sponsored children and hopefully many more. Thank you for your generosity. Secondly, as a church, we're a part of an organization called the Missionary Church, a wonderful denomination. We're very proud of that. And recently, the denomination reached out to us and said, we need churches to just support the mission arm of our denomination. And we as a church said, sign us up. We'll do it. We'll support missionaries all over the world and be a part of creating hope through these incredible families. Know that your gifts go far, they go wide, and your generosity means everything. Thank you for your gifts. You are a gift to us in many ways. 
It's my privilege now as we begin to dig into the word of God together to introduce to you someone that I have a hard time explaining with words how much he means to me. Um, But a a couple of ways to maybe underscore that. He married my wife and I. This is Pastor Duggar got coming up in just a moment. He married us and and we couldn't be more grateful for the service that he gave to us almost 10 years ago in our marriage, on our marriage day. Yeah, he just said, wow. I have a few more gray hairs since then, but it's not because of my wife. It's because of my incredible children. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, he also, if you didn't know this, he, he actually named our third child Samuel uh, in a moment where we just had wonderful time together and we just felt like the, the name was clear. Uh, this brother has mentored me and discipled me for 15 years. So any of my mistakes, any of my troubles, just blame it on him. I'm just saying. Uh, It's his fault. Can you please welcome with me Pastor Doug Ergot? He is going to teach us from the word this morning. Welcome, Doug. Really cry or laugh or celebrate in this moment. So I'm an ugly crier, so I'm going to celebrate, okay? Uh, Thank you. Can I just do something that's going on in my heart right now? All right. Yay! Yay! Clap for God. (laughs) You guys said you were going to help me. Yay! Okay. That's what's going on in my heart right now. I'm excited really to be here again with you all. I was here a few years ago and when... Okay, Paul was just getting started. It's just a joy to watch how God is working in his life and a joy to be a part of God calling him here and what God is doing in and through you all in this community and on the continent of Africa now. What an amazing, amazing relationship that God has developed here. Uh, and now you're coming around to Horizon or Horizon, you're going to let Horizon serve you. Just a great joy for me. I'm just having this triumphal entry uh, Palm Sunday moment in my heart, so I thought I'd let you in on it. And I didn't want rocks to take my place, so I thought I'd start cheering, okay? All right, let's clap for God. Yeah, amen. So maybe you heard about the the on-the-street reporter, and uh, he was trying to collect some data. He wanted to find out what people... thought about ignorance and apathy. So he he went out to the street. He was interviewing people. He said, now, he went up to the first guy. He said, what do you think is worse, ignorance or apathy? The guy looked at him in the face and said, honestly, I don't know and I don't care. (laughs) Well, there are areas of our life where we're all, I'm giving ignorance a positive spin. We just don't know. And there's probably areas of our life where we're apathetic. I want to address some of those this morning. Uh, recently, my wife, Sandy, she's here. Um, clap for her. Raise your hand, honey. She's the, she's the beauty and the brains in this outfit. Um, she had the privilege of speaking to a group of women, and they would be considered spiritually mature at a well-known congregation in our city of Noblesville, Indiana. At one point early in her presentation, she asked a rhetorical question that revealed a dearth of knowledge among these women who would be considered biblically literate by most standards. And the area of lack of information was of particular interest because the question Sandy asked had to do with the situation in which many of these women were living. Sandy had simply asked the ladies to complete the following statement. And the statement is going to come up. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after blank and blank. Can you fill in the blank? Think about it. So whether it was ignorance or apathy, the silence and the lack of response was deafening and discouraging at the same time. And as I said, what's sad about this is that the verse to which Sandy was referring defines both God's concern for their state of life as well as a large body of truth in Scripture, which is often missed or even dismissed. So what do you think? Can you fill in the blank? Blank and blank. Very good. We're going to... I had to tell the last group, so just, you know, don't... Don't brag. 
because we're going to talk about humility too. <laughs> but a few years ago, in 2007, I was in the same unaware category. My staff and I started praying about um, the African orphan crisis, and we got a brochure from this organization called Horizon International, of all places in Pendleton, Indiana. I thought, can anything international come from Pendleton, Indiana? <laughs> but yeah, there it was. And so I went on a vision tour with Bob Pearson and Horizon International in 2007. And as Andres was telling you, my heart too was broken. As we were driving from one drop-in center to another, I was with one of the interns in a vehicle, and the vehicle stopped at the drop-in center. And just so you know, guys, we don't really promote orphanages. We, we, we try to keep children in the home of an extended family member, and then the drop-in centers are a place where they gather daily, and they're, they receive the, fam, fam, the family services that we offer. So I was on the way to a drop-in center, and I get out of the car, and on cue, I know... These girls had to be angels. They'd never seen me before. I'd never seen them before. They were about this tall, dressed very similarly, and they just walked up and they took my hand. And we just started walking, and we started walking to where the rest of the children were, and God just began to deal with my heart and speak to me about how the fact that all this generation of orphans needs is someone who will take them by the hand and walk into the future with them. And that's what I did. And during that walk, God began to open my eyes and teach me some things. And so I just want to share with you some things I have learned. As you uh, identified, James 1.27 states, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Don't miss the second half of that scripture. It's very important. Now, for those who know and love James and his succinct way of summarizing great truths in small doses, this is a classic example of that. In these 30 words, he's revealed the heart of God and embodied the true heart of what it means to reflect God's image in the earth. We must not take it lightly or miss its focus. I think it's so important that I wanted to have you see it in some other expanded versions. Sometimes the word religion in the most common versions uh, kind of scares people. We don't want to be religious. But really, it has some other astounding interpretations. The common English Bible says it this way. True devotion, the kind that is pure and faultless before God the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows and their difficulties and to keep the world from contaminating us. The English Standard Version says it this way. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. I love that. I'm a go team mobilizer. And I, I think it's huge that when you, if you sponsor a child, if you are sponsoring or if you choose to sponsor one today or in the near future, you will have the opportunity to go as a part of a go team. And K-Paul um, uh, has announced in the first service, I think he forgot this time, you guys are planning a go team to Limpopo province next year in June. So put that on your calendar. You'll learn more about that. But you will have the opportunity to meet the children or the child that you sponsor, to see where they live, to put flesh and blood on this relationship, okay? So we visit them. We literally visit them. And keep oneself unstained from the world. The New International Reader's Version says it this way. Here are the kinds of beliefs that God our Father accepts as pure and without fault. When widows and children who have no parents are in trouble, take care of them and keep yourself from being polluted by the world. The Amplified Version says it this way, pure and unblemished religion as it is expressed in outward acts in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit and to look after the fatherless and the widows in their distress, and to keep oneself uncontaminated by the secular world. And the Holy Bible, easy to read version, says it this way, the worship that God wants is this, caring for orphans or widows who need help, and keeping yourself free from the world's evil influence. This is the kind of worship that God accepts as pure and good. Wow. Wow. The fact is, visiting and caring for orphans and widows in their distress and difficulties 
is not just some benevolent humanitarian gesture of goodwill by religious people who may have some concern for suffering people. No, it's all that and more. In fact, it is a mandate from a holy God who sees this concern and care as an expression of true devotion and worship. Without such, our devotion and worship are lacking and incomplete. There's something massive we do not comprehend about God if we fail to recognize His calling to engage with and care for orphans and widows. Devotion to God means devotion to orphans and widows. If worship is the state of being rightly related to God and expressing His image in the world, then we are out of sync with Him if we're not involved with orphans and widows. If worship is a revelation of our love for God and a manifestation of who He is in this earth, then He is best worshipped and most beautifully revealed when we are serving His orphans and widows in their distress. And remember the second part of that verse? This idea cannot be divorced from a call to live a holy life and to restrain ourselves from and remain unblemished by the conforming powers of this fallen world. Caring for orphans and widows is on par with that injunction. Do you hear it? Let me ask another way. How can we be so adamant about keeping ourselves unpolluted from the world's evil influence and be so unaware or apathetic about the command to take care of orphans and widows in their distress. So where did James get this notion, this mandate for true worship and devotion or religion as such? And what does it mean for us, God's people? James is beautifully summarizing an entire body of truth recorded in the First Testament, which reveals God's heart for declaring His holiness and directing His people into worship. So I'd like to talk about three things I've learned since answering the call to care for orphans and widows in their distress. Number one, I've learned that I'm not in the orphan business as much as I am in the image business. This is not just about meeting a need and caring for some unfortunate people. This is about understanding who God is and faithfully representing his image in the earth. There's no better way to reflect the image of God than to care for the orphan and the widow. I see this not just as a need to care for orphans, but as an opportunity to demonstrate the nature and glory of God. So I've got a few scriptures that have really impacted me over the last 11 years or so that I want to share with you. Deuteronomy 10, 15 through 19, it's a big one. It's not up here, but in your uh, worship handout, all the verses that I'm going to be using, uh, the, the entire context is listed on the back so you can connect with the scripture this week on your own and do a soap study in those and let God begin to speak to you about the truth of this issue. But Deuteronomy 10, 15 is huge for me because it says this, To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord has set his affection on your ancestors and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him. This is Moses at the end of his tenure as the leader of Israel, summarizing for the people of God what God wants for them. And in this passage, Moses is calling God's people to their center, to their creator, and describing for them his glory and might. And the next words out of his mouth must be equally important as he says to them, listen, think about this, as he's describing God, this amazing God, God of the heavens, the earth, creator, Lord of lords, God of gods. And he could have said anything following that. What does he say? How does he describe himself? What does he do? He defends the cause of the orphans and the widow and the foreigner. You can use the word marginalized there for the foreigners. And these three terms 
run throughout the first testament and you can if you want to do a study you'll find god's heart as it as it uh, focuses on those three terms so that's what he is as a display and one of the character characteristics of his might and what is the cause of the fatherless and the widow to experience relief from their distress to escape the injustice of oppression and omission to have the opportunity to enjoy life and thrive like anyone else that's the cause to which the creator of the universe is committed. And that's, that's the cause those who claim to represent him must espouse. We must not miss this. As I've been involved with the orphans over the last 11 years, I've seen this as the children, the orphans, those who are stigmatized because of HIV and AIDS and there's place in life that they did not deserve. They're pushed to the back of the line. They're left out of the lines. They're, they're um, ostracized by their own peers, by their own children in their own communities. But a sponsorship, an American parent, fills them with hope, lets them know someone outside their orbit, outside their sphere of hopelessness, cares about them. It, it, it speaks volumes to them that they have a purpose in life. And that's why we say we are creating a world of hope through orphans in Africa. Hope is what we bring to these children. Here's another very poignant passage, I'm sure, powerfully influenced James thinking it's Psalm 68 5 and again I think you need to read the whole context here because the psalmist is creating a worship environment talking about worship and in the middle of this worship environment he says a father to the fatherless a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling so in Deuteronomy uh, the author speaks about what God does he defends the cause of the orphan and the widow and in the psalm, he says, this is who God is. This is who God is, and this is what God does. How can we, the church, not understand that and get connected to and committed to that? We must mark it well and discover its meaning for us. Secondly, I'm learning that Jesus brought the marginalized to the middle of his attention and now I'm learning to see the harvest from Jesus' point of view. The word harvest in the New Testament is an interesting word. Everywhere it occurs, Jesus is referring to the marginalized. And I've learned that I had a huge blind spot regarding this issue. And honestly, I think it's affecting the church as well. I think the church has a real blind spot it needs to consider when, when we talk about the harvest you know, and you're not bad if you have a blind spot. It's just we all have blind spots. The, there's a lot happening in those blind spots that can mean a lot. When I was in, about 18 years old, my friend was driving. I was in the passenger seat, and he pulled out right in front of a pickup truck traveling about 70 miles an hour. And for the grace of God and the fact that the pickup truck sauce was able to swerve, he hit a guardrail, took out the side of his truck, I wouldn't be here because of a blind spot. It's important to ask God, where are our blind spots so that something bad doesn't happen to someone else? And so this is not just about meeting a need and caring for some unfortunate people. This is about lifting our gaze and seeing and responding to one of the greatest harvest opportunities of our generation. The marginalized, the orphan, and the widow were always the focus of Jesus' attention. And it's always where he can continue to focus the vision and attention of his disciples. Listen to Jesus in John 4.35. After Jesus had had an encounter with a marginalized woman, the, Peter, um, the, 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 the disciples came to him with food and were wondering what he was, why he was talking to this woman, wondering why he wasn't hungry. And he just he summarized uh, the whole conversation with this injunction. He said, don't you say, there are still four more months, and then comes the harvest. No, listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest now. So after this transformational conversation with this marginalized woman who then becomes a catalyst for the transformation of an entire city of marginalized people, Jesus implores his disciples to stop making excuses and to open their eyes, to raise their gaze, to see what they had refused to see up to this point. 
the harvest opportunity, which was right before them, and that all they had to do was reap it because God had already planted and prepared it for them. Another example that in the life of Jesus worth mentioning when we talk about this word harvest is in Matthew 9, 35 through 37. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Here again, Jesus defines his view of the harvest, the marginalized, the forgotten, the unattended, the under-resourced ones. And he uses three descriptors that immediately turn my mind to the orphan. Did you see them? They're harassed. They're helpless. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Many of these children we're involved with have been orphaned. By the time they're three or four years old, they've never really known their parents. They've lived with grandparents. The grandparents have died. They've gone to aunt, the homes of an aunt or an uncle. They've been ostracized there. They're kind of like the Cinderella of the home. They have to do all the chores. All the other kids pick on them. The aunties don't really want them, but African culture, they require to take them in. And so these kids are growing up in these harassed, helpless environments like sheep without a shepherd. Think about what a sheep, what a shepherd does for his sheep. He protects them. He provides for them. He guides them. And that's what's happening in our networks all around the five countries in which we work. Places like the drop-in centers in Limpopo. The kids come. They feel protected. They have an environment of protection. They have someone who's providing for them, guiding them, giving them instruction, leading them to Jesus, discipling them. And then Jesus does something I think is very peculiar to us in our way of thinking. He invokes prayer not for the harvest, but for the laborers. He doesn't urge us to pray for the harvest. The harvest is ripe. We don't need to pray for the harvest. He invites us. He commands us. In fact, it's the only place in Scripture where Jesus says, hey, here's what you need to tell me to do. We love to tell God what to do, right? Well, this place, is, it's, it's legit. We get to tell Jesus what to do. Jesus, please send harvesters, send laborers. He invites us to pray for laborers. This is not a harvest problem. This is a labor problem. The opportunities are great. It's not just a need. It's an opportunity. And the laborers are missing. Another friend of mine, David Glaze from Maryland went with me. I met him in Nicaragua where we worked together. And then he wanted to become involved in Africa. And so he went to a place called Kasese, Uganda. It's as close to the middle of nowhere as I can figure. And we went out in this little town to a place where our partner there was kind of dreaming about a drop-in center kind of idea. And he was wanting to show us this land that was available. And as we were just there for 10 or 15 minutes looking at this piece of property, at least a hundred children, maybe more, they just saw the Mzungus and they just flooded to us. They, they surrounded us. Many of them had only a t-shirt, no underclothing, no pants, no shoes. The, sh the shirts on, they were, that they had were dirty and tattered. And we were just playing with them, singing with them. And David tells me later, he said, in that moment, he said, I didn't, I had a vision of not just trees with fruit on them. I had a vision of fruit falling on the ground and rotting. The harvest is ripe. The laborers are few. And finally, I'm learning that given the opportunity and the resources, these beautiful children and young adults who have been unjustly and undeservedly forced to the margins are becoming the leaders and influencers who are making a difference for the next generation. This is not just about meeting a need and caring for some unfortunate people. This is about making disciples and empowering people who are becoming the answer to the problems and the issues of their own countries and cultures. I tell Americans when I say, look, Americans, we're not the answer. We're the catalyst. We're, we're the, we're, we can help. But the African children who are becoming disciples and making disciples, they're the answer. But we have to be involved in that, our part of the equation. 
Jesus never said, go into all the world and meet all the needs. But he did say, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And that is the heart of what we do. We focus on meeting needs in a holistic way that empowers people, children, our partners, to know and become disciples of Jesus. And now as we're in our 19th year of existence, we're seeing many children who become adults and disciples. They're coming back to Horizon, to our network, as leaders and disciple makers themselves. It's truly inspiring and godly and kingdom-esque. And here's how we do that. We partner with churches like Avalon. We partner with people like you. We even partner with businesses to empower them to be engaged in significant and strategic ways that result in community transformation. We define our mission as creating a world of hope through orphans in Africa affected by HIV and AIDS. But we're not, and we sponsor children, but we're not just a sponsorship organization. We are a church partnership and empowerment organization seeking to make a difference in communities through orphans. There are six areas of engagement where we work to empower churches in this harvest field. Uh, we have a guy on staff, Chris Mason, he's here. We have information that can help you look at these six, six areas of engagement and you're involved in several of them already, and we like to just say, hey, how can we help you do better in the areas where you're engaged, and maybe what's next for you? Like, you're taking the next step now. You've been involved in sponsorship and project giving. Now you're taking the next step by sending a GO team next year. And when you come back from that, we'll debrief that. We'll say, well, how, how can we help you do that better? What, what's next for you? We want to be strategic. We want you to, to, to know how God is calling you to partner in this, in this harvest field. Okay? K. Paul is aware of all these areas, so ask us more about it if you'd like to know. But today we're focusing on one of the most critical areas, which is child sponsorship. K. Paul is coming in a moment to walk you through that opportunity, but I just want to make it really simple by sharing one more thing I've learned. I've learned that Jesus makes this issue very simple. Jesus said, whatever you want others to do for you, that is what you should do for others. So I began asking myself, and asking my children, if I had not been here to care for you, if you were not here to care for your children, what is the least you would want someone to do for your children if you were not here to take care of them? Is $40 a month too much? Is that out of reach for someone to do for your children if you were not here to take care of them? That's a great question to ask yourself because that makes it real. According to Jesus, then, we must care for orphans the same way as we would want others to care for our children if we were not here to take care of them. Simple. And I've learned the joy of doing for others what I would want them to do for me as I've engaged with the orphans and widows and the marginalized in Africa. My last word is simply this. Now you know. What you do with it is up to you. Would you pray with me, please? And I'm going to invite the choir to come as I'm praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, we worship you in this place. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty of who you are and what you're doing in the world. We thank you, God, that you have the orphan, the widow, the marginalized in the center of your heart, and you're inviting us there. You invite us there, Lord, where you where you love and care for them, and we experience your love and your care, God, as we are involved in those you love and care for so much. So I thank you for Avalon. I thank you for Kay Paul and Bethany, the leadership team here, Lord, that is guiding this church into the heart of your, the center of your heart. Thank you for everyone here, Lord, that uh, wants to be involved in this. I thank you, God, for their heart, that they want to obey you and love you and, and just um, worship you in beautiful ways. God, we thank you for this weekend. We thank you for how you're moving us, motivating us, and enlightening us to who you are and what you're doing. God, we just uh, allow you, we give this time over to you, and I bless this congregation, and thank you for helping it take next steps in positive, powerful, impactful ways, Lord. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.
You all are amazing. Let's give them one more big round of applause. Amazing. Yeah. I want you all to just look at me, all the, all the, every one of you, I want you to look at me. This is, this is a little awkward, isn't it? <laughs> I want you to hear some words from all of us. We believe in you, and we love you, and thank you for being the hope of your families, for being the hope of your communities, and for changing the world for Christ. We believe in you. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. All right, I'm not going to embarrass you anymore. Go ahead and grab a seat. You don't know this, but, uh, or maybe you, some of you do, but this is the first stop in this tour, the Midwest tour of them bringing hope to thousands. So pray for them. Would you, I would encourage all of us, just pray for these incredible young world changers as they go around and bring hope to many. There's a couple people that I want to thank, and then we're going to explain, give directions, and then, and then get you uh, going to the back. Uh, thanks again for being here. The first family I'd like to thank is the Enix family, uh, a dear family that literally sponsored this weekend and made the choir coming possible. Can we give that family a big round of applause? Thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. Secondly, I want to thank Bob Pearson. He's in the back. Bob, if you could uh, raise your hand. This is the president of Horizon International. If you could just look back and thank him. Uh, Bob, I'm not going to embarrass you. You're a dear friend and a dear brother, but I just want to say thank you for responding to the dream that God put in your heart to bring hope to a, a continent for these wonderful children. Thank you for being obedient and faithful. Bob Pearson, we love you very much. For the rest of us, as we wrap up this incredible time of, of, of worship, um, I just want to speak some truth over this church, over Avalon. We are devoted. We are a devoted people. That's who we are. We are ready to empower a generation of children to reach their country for Christ. That is who we are. Thank you to the six families that have for many years now sponsored children and Matsui Village. That is where we're focused. That's where we're going to go next June. We're going to bring a team of people. Thank you for those six families. Thank you for your faithfulness. What am I asking you not to do? I'm going to start with that. I am not asking you to give less to this great church so that you might sponsor I'm not asking you to give less to any other wonderful charitable organization that you might sponsor. What I am asking you to do is simple. It's this. I'm asking you to live on a dollar 30 cents less a day. I'm asking everyone that would feel the nudge, feel the impression in their heart to respond today to live on a dollar and 30 cents less each day. That one child might get a chance to thrive for tomorrow. That's what I'm asking you to do. Bethany and I love to give to places that are changing lives and bringing hope, which is why we love to give to this church and we love to give to Horizon International. This is Eva, our child. We're proud of Eva. We're proud of what she means to her community and what she means to us. She's a part of our family. I dream of the day that we as a church would have one child per family, that we would sponsor one child per family and move even closer into the heart of what God is doing and of who God is. I dream of that day. There are tables in the back. Go check them out. I hope that you get questions answered, and I hope that you join this great movement of God. Before we get you Moving on, let's pray together. Pray with me. God, thank you for these incredible young world changers. We pray your anointing and your blessing over their lives. We pray that you would protect them in their travels to multi-states across the Midwest. 
God, I pray that people would respond in a powerful way to the, the great opportunity that we have here to live out what it looks like to follow Christ. God, I pray for our church that we would more and more courageously and bravely and faithfully move into what you call us into, and that is fighting for justice, bringing hope, sharing truth, and making disciples. Father, it's in your name that we pray, your precious name. In Jesus' name, let's say it together, church. Amen. Let's give them one more round of applause. You guys did awesome. Amazing.